Thank you. Well, we are really happy to have Ann Ellison here, and I will introduce her in a minute, but it's we, we've started to get involved with, with Mental Health Connect in our church, and uh, we can talk more about that later, but that's how we heard about Ann, and it's trying to be able to have mental health be something that, number one, is visible and we can talk about, and it's not, you know, such a hidden thing. But also, how can we as a church do uh, be supportive? And Anne is the uh, Director of Interfaith Health for M Health Fairview, and she's going to be discussing uh, something called HOPE, which is Health Outcomes of Positive Experiences. And so, uh, Anne, thank you so much for coming, and I'll, you take it from there. I am happy to. Um, thank you for the invitation, and I'm I'm really excited to be with you this morning. Um, really good discussion in our breakout group, by the way. Um, uh, as as Susan mentioned, I direct a function for M Health Fairview called Interfaith Health. And for those of you who may not know, Fairview, in its history, actually was founded by Lutheran pastors. And over a hundred plus years ago. And so the work that I do is, is the remaining connection that the organization has to faith communities. Um, and that's the interfaith health piece. It's really about how we as an organization can acknowledge the fact that health happens outside of our doors. Um, it doesn't happen in our clinics and hospitals. It really is about where people live, work, play, worship, um, that we can impact health, not illness or critical care. Um, and so we um, have a relationship with now about a hundred faith communities where we just support whatever those faith communities want to do around that intersection of faith and health. So that's what interfaith health is. And I'm happy to talk more about that at any point. Um, but let me also give you a little bit of background. I am a 37 year Fairview employee um, I started as a medical social worker many years ago, um, so that's my background. Um, I moved out of the clinical side. I did hospital social work for about half of my career, um, working in everything from orthopedics and mental health and long-term care, um, and then into a corporate role that was about community outreach and, how, again, how we impact health in the community. So I've been around the organization a long time, and, and um in the last couple of years, I've done some work with uh, a colleague in Chicago out of Advocate Health System uh, who does similar work. And she used a phrase at one point that really piqued my interest. And the phrase was, I do some work around trauma-informed congregations. And I thought, hmm, I need to know more about what that is. And so I've spent about the last couple of years doing work around to get myself up to speed in terms of what, how we define trauma, what trauma is, how all of this backgrounding. And I tell you all of that because I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I am just somebody who likes to share information. And this information that I'm going to share with you, I think is really important for all of us in terms of building up um, strong, resilient, community members. Um, so that's, I would just want to preface it with, I'm not an expert, but I've learned a lot in the last couple of years and I'd like to share it. Um, so that's where I would like to leave that piece. Um, we can't really get to the hope, the health outcomes of positive experiences without taking a step back first and talking about something called ACEs adverse childhood experiences. Now, some of you, I would guess, maybe have heard that language, um, but we need to talk about that because hope, this concept of health outcomes of positive, positive experiences, really is very similar science, and it's those hopeful activities that actually mitigate the impact of childhood trauma. So that's where I'm going. So let's back up a little bit and talk about ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. This was a, a really groundbreaking study that took place in 1998. Um, now, if I share my screen, can I do that? Am I okay to? 
Ah, there we go. Cool. Now, can you see my slide? Cool. All right. Um, there's a purpose for that. The, I want to talk about that sort of tagline on this front slide. Um, you know, hope standing for health outcomes of positive experiences. Really, in a nutshell, your history is not your destiny. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, let's see. Oh, for some reason, my slides are not advancing. Hold on. Huh. Oh, there we go. Okay. It's just a little slow this morning. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so the ACE study took place in 1998. Um, the key author was a, a physician by the name of Dr. Vince Folletti um, and others at Kaiser and the CDC. And well, uh, Dr. Folletti is a, a physician who primarily focuses in the area of obesity. And he began to notice we're struggling with obesity and a connection or a frequency of those who experience some sort of abuse in their childhood. And so he wanted to dig a little deeper into this. And so he partnered with Kaiser and um, did a very, a large study, um, over 17,000 patients in the Kaiser system. Now note that in the Kaiser system, these were insured middle income to higher income individuals. These were not low income, um, challenged poverty, um, patients. These were folks who had insurance and had, um, you know, were middle income. They were employed, they were mixed gender, but mostly white, middle class, and upper class individuals. Their average age was 57. Um, but one of the, one of the initial um, drawbacks of this study is that it was not people of color, and it was not urban, and it was not poor. So think about, generally, we're talking about us, right? Um, in that study, um, they, they asked a questionnaire about the frequency of these 10 things that you see on the screen. Um, and the question was, between the ages of zero and 18, how often did you experience emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, these 10 things? And so it was on a scale of never, rarely, you know, like hurt scale. Um, and two thirds of the participants. So just we dig into the results of this study. They A, identified these 10 ACEs. Two thirds of the participants, again, 17,000 people, um, reported at least one of these adverse childhood experiences. So these are, the, when people talk about ACEs, these are the 10 things that they're talking about. Emotional abuse in the home, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, physical neglect, domestic violence, loss of a parent, whether that was lost through a death or lost through divorce, alcohol or drug abuse in the home, household mental illness or suicide, and a household member incarcerated. So when people talk about the 10 ACEs, these are they. Um, again, two thirds of the participants reported at least one ACE, 40% had two or more ACEs. Um, and what they found in this study was that the number of ACEs that you have in, in, in their survey, the number that you report has a really strong association with adult risk behaviors. In other words, the higher your ACE score, the more likely you would be to engage in um, promiscuity, smoking, drugs, those kinds of things. What they also found is that high risk behaviors if you're in, so if you have 10, you know, a, a, a number of these 10 ACEs, you're more likely to experience or to engage in high risk behaviors. And as a result, more likely to have poor health outcomes. That's the link we need to make is the higher your risk behaviors, the more you are going to experience diabetes, cancer, hypertension, heart disease, mental illness, and suicide attempts. 
really interesting science. So they could make that correlation. Um, each, if you're taking an ACE score test, an, a, you know, an ACE questionnaire, each type of trauma is one, no matter how often it's experienced. Um, people with an ACE score of four or more are twice as likely to smoke. They're seven times more likely to be alcoholic. They have increased risk of emphysema and chronic bronchitis by 400%. They have an increased risk of attempting suicide by, get this, 1,200%. Um, and an ACE score of six or higher those who experience an ACE score of six or higher are, are at risk of shortening their lifespan by 20 years. That's why it caught the attention, it has caught the attention that it has. Um, it really is about correlating what happens to you as a child in terms of these adverse childhood experiences and the health risks and health outcomes you have as an adult. Um, there is all kinds of science out there now about brain development, this, the neuroscience of brain development. And that is the other component that this really speaks to. Um, there's a story, and if you, if you want to dig into a about 14 minute TED talk that explains this whole science of ACEs, um, probably one of the most vocal um, advocates around this ACE piece is a physician out of California by the name of Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. She is now the Surgeon General for the state of California. She's a pediatri pediatrician by background. And she will say that the, the knowledge about the ACE study transformed her pediatric practice. So she was one of the first to, to screen all of her patients for these 10 ACEs so that she could help her patients and their parents make the correlation between what happens to them as a child and what happens to them around their health status as an adult. If you want to go to her TED talk, she does a, a TED talk um, that uh, I think it's from 2016. So again, keep in mind that the ACEs work has started well over 20 years ago. Um, but it's 14 minutes and she will tell the story about toxic stress. It is toxic stress that changes the neurobiology of the brain. And she says, you know, we all need the kind of, um, the kind of stress that, you know, our brain, if we come across a bear in the, she'll tell the story. If we come across a bear in the woods, right? You and I, our stress hormones will kick in, our anxiety might kick in and it'll sort of cause us to run, right? What, and she will say then, what happens when the bear comes home every night? And you are exposed, children are exposed to repeated toxic stress. That's what changes the neuro neurobiology of the brain. It has prolonged exposure to adrenaline and cortisol, and that really changes the brain function and impacts childhood brain development. So there are neurological impacts, and then there are impacts on their social and emotional development occur when toxic stress is a part of everyday life for kids. So that's, that's all the work about ACEs. Um, the impact of ACEs, and again, this is just a, a graphic from the World Health Organization, where on the bottom, you've got adverse childhood experiences impacting social, emotional, and cognitive impairments. Um, they then ad adopt high-risk behaviors, which result in disease, disability, and social issues, which ultimately reset, result in that 20-year difference in lifespan or early death. There is um, now a new graphic that I haven't found a source for, but that the newer slides have two more tiers below the adverse childhood experiences tier that talk about the social conditions in which you're raised also impact health. And now there are also impacts of generational issues, historical trauma, epigenetics, if you wanna use the term epigenetics. Um, all of those things now again, 
add up to that impact of, of um, social, emotional, cognitive impairment, high-risk behaviors. So it's really about how we grow up and um, all the way back to historical trauma and epigenetics. If you want to um, read any more about the is issues of historical trauma and epigenetics, I would recommend a book called My Gra Grandmother's Hands um, by a local uh, gentleman by, by the name of Resma Menicum. Um, it's really a good, a good um, grounding in what we mean when we say historical trauma and epigenetics, but all of this is impacting um, childhood development. And um, really what this is, this whole ACE piece is about is moving from that mindset of what is wrong with you when you're talking about someone who has behavior that are, is different, what is wrong with you to what happened to you? It's a real shift in thinking. Um, and for those of you who might be followers of Oprah, Oprah has a new book. And um, the title of the book is What Happened to You? Because she's gotten on this bandwagon about ACEs and trauma and healing. Um, I have not yet read the book. I have it ordered and I expect it to be delivered on Monday. Um, but it's this, all, all that is to say, there is so much going on in this um, discipline uh, around trauma and ACEs and healing that there, it's hard to avoid in today's world. Um, but again, this is really the mind shift from, from going from thinking about what is wrong with that person to, hmm, I wonder what happened to them. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's then move to the science of hope because this really is about ACEs moving forward. Um, you can't, you know, ACEs is about what happened to you. ACEs is about adversity in childhood. ACEs is, is about um, your history. And that's why I use the phrase, your history is not destiny. Because this next level of science, the science of hope really um, can impact the outcome of trauma. So um, let me talk a little bit about the science of this. Um, there were, uh, there's a physician, again, by the name of Dr. Rebet, Robert Sege, S-E-G-E. -E. And if you want to dig into more, he is really out there um, right now doing a lot of talks and a lot of conferences and a lot of, a lot of um, research. Um, this was a study, he was the principal author in a study that um, took place in 2015 um, using the Wisconsin Behavioral Risk Factor Survey and really created a, a framework around this concept of health outcomes of positive experiences. Um, and that framework was published in 2017. So it's much more recent. Um, and it really is about both ACEs and positive experiences. In other words, he was trying to answer the question if, why is it that some people who experience some of those 10 adverse childhood experiences, why is it that some folks who experience them thrive? They move forward, they can um, come out on, quote, come out on the other side, they can <clears throat> have a positive, productive adult lifestyle, and why is it that others don't? So he was trying to figure out what it was that made the difference. Um, so he asked similar questions in terms of um, the population, how often, and again, zero to 18 year olds, how often do you experience these seven positive childhood experiences? So how often did you feel able to talk to your family about your feelings? How often did you feel your family stood by you in difficult times? How often did you enjoy participating in community traditions? How often did you feel a sense of belonging? And I think that's a key word, that belonging concept. And again, particularly in high school, how often did you feel supported by friends? Did you have at least two non-parent adults who took a genuine interest in you? And how often did you feel safe and protected by an adult in your home? 
What's interesting is that um, there are two that had the greatest protective impact on kids that had experienced ACEs. And those two, anybody want to guess? <laughs> I can tell you. Those two were that they felt that their family stood by them during difficult times and that they had someone to talk to when they had difficult, when there were difficult times, talk to, about feelings. What I think, and part of the reason that I, I appreciate bringing this to you all in a faith community context is I look at those and I think about the, the one that says enjoyed participating in community traditions. And I think about having at least two non-parent adults who took a genuine interest. When I read those, I thought, well, okay, there is a role for our faith communities to play. If we as a community of faith can be a part of the traditions of a family, the rituals of our faith, and if we can introduce kind, caring adults who take an interest in the lives of our youth, then we really have the potential to impact kids who've had difficult experiences growing up. Does that make sense? Um, let's talk a little bit more about this. Um, the impact Obviously, there's an impact on health outcomes, some of those adverse childhood experiences impacts. But what um, Dr. Sege found in the HOPE study was that these seven things had an even greater impact when we were talking about the mental health of children. And what he found was that adults who had three or more ACEs, but all three or more positive childhood experiences had lower rates of depression. They had lower rates of poor health, lower rates of obesity, and they had lower rates of, of smoking and drug use. So these really are, and the term that's being used now, these really are protective factors for kids who might be experiencing adverse childhood experiences at home. These bring about that resilience that we keep talking about now post pandemic. These seven things are protecting the, are warding off the impact of adverse childhood experiences. Positive experiences truly are those protective factors. Um, there have been a couple of really recent studies like February of 2020 and um, another one in April of 2021. So this is, again, a really dynamic area of study um, that uh, really wanted to dig into whether there were racial disparities in hope. Um, and I offer that to you, not necessarily to cast a shadow on you know, folks in the black community, but really to say, this is a dynamic area of research right now. Um, and this study in 2020 found that there really are differences. There are disparities across races, even in the concept of health outcomes of positive experiences. I was talking with a, a colleague of mine who leads an initiative in the African-American churches. And he said it made perfect sense to him because often uh, in their community, there's only one parent in the house and they can't be the mentor or the leader or the, the person that they would like to be in terms of these seven outcomes or these seven protective factors. Um, there is a disparity because of the lifestyle that folks live. Um, there's a disparity because children of color may not have access to the mentors or the adults who took genuine interest. They may not live in environments that are safe and they may not be able to um, have folks um, participate in community tradition. So it's really, um, again, it's, it's a dynamic area of study. Um, 
in a nutshell, these positive childhood experiences mitigate the effects of ACEs and prevent the toxic stress that we talked about earlier. They promote healing and recovery from the impact of ACEs. Um, and I think the study overall and the science that's moving forward really um, acknowledges the fact that adversity, those ACEs, doesn't happen in a vacuum. You can have both adverse and positive experiences in the same household. Even when, um, so those positive experiences can and do exist alongside ACEs, um, but they do also mitigate the impact of adverse child experiences. So there are what uh, this HOPE framework presented were these things called pillars of hope. Um, the framework is focused around cultivating relationships and environments that promote healthy childhood development. So think about if you're being faced with this research and it's all about healthy childhood development, where do we need to put our energy? Let's talk about how do we equip parents? How do we tell parents about this stuff so that they can promote healthy childhood development in their own families? So part of me wants to get this information to childcare providers and everybody who's interacting with parents. Um, it's, it's important work. It's important for us to help equip parents to um, build up the resilience and the hope in their own children. Um, in these four pillars, um, and I want you to note, um, all four of these first words are really active words. <laughs> Being, living, engaging, development. This is active stuff that we can do. How is it that um, in, we can bring children to being in nurturing and supportive relationships? How can we help them um, develop secure attachments that allow them to have a buffer when in stressful times, um, both internal to the family and outside the family, sustained relationships. And quite frankly, that's what brought me to this work was this um, statement that a friend of mine made about the presence of a kind and caring adult in a child's life makes all the difference. Um, so it's about being in those nurturing, supportive relationships. It's about living in and playing and learning in safe, stable, protective, and equitable environments. And we hear a lot about equity these days. Um, but think about how do we promote security for families and kids? How do we have stable environments? How can we help promote stable housing? If, you know, one predictor of instability in a family is their housing. Um, how can we promote stable housing, adequate nutrition, good sleep, medical and dental care, access to health care, equitable school environments? This is all about the environment in which we raise our children can really be a pillar um, if we can have positive uh, environments. Engaging. Let's talk about engaging in, in constructive social civic activities that develop a sense of connectedness. It's that belonging and connectedness. And again, here's a role for our faith communities. If we can be a part of families' lives, a part of children's lives through, through our sacraments and through our confirmation and through our youth groups, that really is a pillar for health outcomes of positive experiences. How do we bring joy and fun with others? How do we build awareness of culture and religious traditions or rituals? How do we, again, cultivate that sense of belonging um, really builds up our kids? And then this last one is really about developing social and emotional competencies, self-regulation, self-awareness, how do we help children learn how to express their feelings? How do we build empathy? I think there's, there's a lot of new work out there around this concept of empathy, feeling for one another. How do we build confidence? How do we build interpersonal 
skills in our kids so that when they are faced with adversity or stress, they can talk about it, they can process it, and they can move forward. Those really are um, the four pillars of hope. Um, I added this slide most recently um, simply because of the environment that we have been in for the last year and a half or so. If we think about what we know about ACEs and we think about now what we know about hope and that sense of belonging and connectedness and social and emotional development, think about the impact of COVID on that and on our kids and on all of us. I mean, they're now, our kids are now working or learning in an education environment that is completely foreign to parents and to kids. Um, and they have not had the social connection that, they, that we had in the classroom or that they have had in previous classrooms. We've all experienced greater isolation as a result of the last um, year and a half. How do we maintain social connections in a difficult environment, environment like this? And then let's think about the impact of COVID on families. Um, think about the economic impact our families have had to bear Think about parental stress. Think about loss of so much for all of us. Um, when I think about kids, and I want to go back up to isolation for a minute. Um, if kids are working in a, are learning in a virtual environment and they're at home, think about the things that our teachers and our counselors and our others would see in a live environment in their classrooms. So things like hunger, have, may have gone unnoticed because kids aren't in the classroom, they're in their homes. Um, issues of abuse that may have happened in their homes that they can't get away from because they're supposed to be learning in that home environment. And then again, the, that loneliness for kids who aren't having the interaction with kids their own age. Um, all of those fall into some of those adverse childhood experiences, but we can do a lot to build a sense of hope. Um, and then if you think about the impact of, um, particularly here in Minnesota, the impact of social unrest in the last year, we're coming up on the anniversary of George, George Floyd's death. And think about that, what, what that may have done to a, a child's sense of safety, um, both in their home and in their community, their fear, their anxiety, and their mental health. So I, I added that slide simply because culture and surroundings matter. Um, in terms of adverse childhood experiences and positive childhood experiences. Um, and I mentioned that there's lots of new studies. In 2019, there was a study that talked about kids who experience, now I wanna get the acronym straight, um, but the framework is this HOPE framework, but the ACEs is again, adverse childhood experiences and PCEs is positive childhood experiences. So, um, now what I'm seeing in the literature and in some of what I'm involved in is called, they're calling them together PACEs, positive and adverse childhood experiences. But what this 2019 study said is that people who experience positive childhood experiences become adults who can seek support and get care. And subsequently, adults who seek support and get care have improved symptoms even if mental illness is present. So there's lots of study about the impact of this going on. Even this one, in, uh, and this was literally a month ago, 2021, um, in the Journal of Child Abuse and Neglect was where that the study around racial and ethnic minority groups of children had lower likelihood of mentorship, lower likelihood of living in a safe and supportive neighborhood than their non-Hispanic white counterparts. Um, true for black children who also had a lower likelihood of having a mentor for advice and guidance. So this is a very dynamic area of research and study right now. Uh, and I expect that we will see more and more. Um, so let's think about how, okay, so now that we know all this, what do we do about it? How do we integrate this concept or this framework of hope into our congregation? I think it starts um, really with awareness. So this session alone, just the learning of this session makes you all aware of the fact that these things exist. Um, and, and it makes you aware of the fact that we all bring our history, both positive, you know, paces. We bring paces, positive and adverse childhood experiences into our own relationships. 
Um, we need to reassure our communities and our, our, ourselves and one another that history is not destiny. We do not have to be a victim of our past, um, that there is no shame in asking for or receiving help. And we, there are better ways to live. Risk is not, so that adverse childhood experience, the, that, that um, risk of really poor health outcomes does not have to be a diagnosis or a, de or a destiny. Um, let's talk about how do we as a faith community um, promote a nurturing, supportive environment? How do we promote nurturing, supportive relationships? by addressing parents. How can we help parents who are raising kids? Um, how can we encourage the active engagement with kids? How can we share positive parenting information with members of our communities? How can we as a faith community support safe, stable, protective, and equitable environments? How do we make sure that our families are getting their basic needs met you know, during COVID when so many families have lost jobs and have lost income, how do we make sure that things like housing and food and clothing and transportation are there for our families? How do we as a faith community provide opportunities for constructive engagement of our kids? How do we help them know that they belong in our faith community? How do we um, have maybe extracurricular activities? How do we um, have outings? How do we, at least now, we might have greater freedom to gather together and support one another? How do we promote volunteer opportunities that bring about confidence and self-healing um, for kids and all of us? How do we build empathy and resilience as a part of our faith communities? Um, that's a lot to take in in a fairly short period of time. Um, do we want to have some discussion? Do we want to do some breaking into small groups? What do you think, Susan? I, <clears throat> yeah, I certainly think it would be good to have uh, to, to have to flesh this out a little bit, to have a little bit more talk about questions or, or that. I'm trying to decide if we should do small groups or, or possibly this large group. Um, well, we, we, we can certainly open it up just for questions right now. Yeah, why don't we do, why don't we stay in a large group just so okay. everyone can hear Anne's responses? Okay, okay. okay. Anne, do you wanna stop sharing your screen and then we'll- Ah, yes, thank you. Stop share. There we go. And then Su <laughs> Susan, you had put a question in the chat. Do you want to start us off with um, with that? Right. I, I was just wondering about any uh, research or data that you have about hmm. churches, maybe who intentionally work on some of these positive behaviors. Yeah, I have not seen any research. I've heard a couple of stories um, from some faith communities, particularly out on the East Coast, um, that are working to strengthen. Um, and that's where, that's where I got the message about um, strengthening the work that we do for parents um, in our communities. So parents need to learn this stuff so that you know, we can, they can also feel confident in how they're raising their children, how they're being a part of a larger community. Um, so they, the, the couple of stories that I've heard of churches that are doing work around this really have embraced a concept of how, uh, you know, if they have a daycare in their church, um, they've implemented some of this theory in that daycare. And in all of the work that they're doing with young families and parents, they're doing education around this as well. Looks like we have a couple of questions here. We'll go to, um, uh, sorry, Tony, and then to Paul. Okay, am I on? Yeah, I'm yep. uh, unmuted. Uh, one of the things that is entirely 
in line with the parent education is we have established early childhood family education. Mm -hmm. It addresses um, parenting birth to five. And I cannot tell you how many people said to me when they were uh, going into, their kids were out of the early childhood program, they're entering into the public school system and they said, but we need this parent education to continue its, and so it's, there is uh, a format there that can certainly be brought into the church mm -hmm. that is um, already sort of in place, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you can just expand, extend that through the age groups. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have to tell you as a parent, I raised three sons. Um, when I heard, and some of you may recollect, um, Dr. David Walsh and yes. some of the work yes. that he did, when I heard him say from a brain development standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, uh, boys particularly, um, their brains are not fully developed until they get to 23 to 25. <laughs> so it's like, okay, that's, this is a long parenting journey. All of that is to say it is a long parenting journey and kids brains develop at different levels at different stages and you are exactly right if we could take all of the intensity of learning that you get at zero to five in a, in a head start or an early childhood program mm -hmm. and stretch that out for the changes and development of the brain over the course of a kid's life man we'd be, we'd be doing great work yep. for parents. Um, Paul, Paul had a question and then Michael, and then Gary. Uh, I have a, uh, a testimony and a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the, on the uh, two uh, non-parent adults, I had a, a Boy Scout leader who was also my track coach. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he took my younger brother and myself out on camping trips. Uh, it was really a wonderful thing for me. I had a poor relationship with my father, but uh, he was like a father. And then mm -hmm. I also had my second non-parenting adult was a youth pastor at my church who uh, taught me how to drive a car. We went out to a cow pasture. Uh, I was too much of a threat to my dad's car so, uh, but uh, John Cronlocken was happy to take me out to a car pasture, and I drove around parallel parking the whole bit. My question, uh, I think your point about two non-parenting adults is very strong. My question is about your fourth point uh, in the integrating into the congregation. I think it was uh, risk is not a diagnosis or a uh, destiny. Correct. Uh, what is the point? I need some help here. Uh, is the point to encourage risk taking? Uh, no, the, the point is that you may have risk factors because of the adverse experiences that you had as a child. In other words, in the presence of adverse experiences, your risk for health out, poor health outcomes goes up, but that risk does not have to be your destiny. In other words, you can mitigate and lower your risk in the presence of these positive experiences. Thank you. Oh. Okay. You got it. Michael and then Gary. Yeah, uh, a couple of things that are sort of related. One, um, if, you, if you think of this as interventions to create positive experiences, um, in my experience, it's kind of hard to do that without creating some kind of uh, status differential or stigma or something like that in the families. And that goes back to my earliest experiences with family education programs. And most I was working at a technical college and we had a, a, a family program there, a family resource center. And most of the people who referred to them for parent education were coming out of the child welfare system, mm. sort of like a sense. Mm -hmm. and there is that kind of vague association in my mind. I don't know if it is in, in 
the minds of parents today. But if you say, boy, you need parent education, that sort of sounds like there's something wrong. So one is overcoming that. Mm -hmm. The second is that we become so uh, sensitive to and aware of the potential for child sexual abuse and other forms of abuse in our establishments. I know most organizations now require criminal background checks and so forth. And and how do you tiptoe around that and foster just a good, healthy uh, social interaction between those uh, non-related adult mentors uh, and, and not risk that kind of damage? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So your first point really is about how do we overcome the stigma mm-hmm. that's associated with, quote, parent education as it, as it was mandated. Um, I think we have to normalize it. I mean, I think we have to just, we don't, it doesn't have to be sitting in a classroom, you know, with a lecture. It's just, it's sort of coming alongside a parent when they're in your narthex at your church and just saying, how's it going? Or did you know? So we you put it as a part of your normal conversation, normalize it. And it, it doesn't have to be the institutionalized parent education classes that I think we're all used to. It, it can be a much formal way of, of educating, relating to, and being that kind and caring adult for the parent and the child. Um, and I think your second point about about having to overcome criminal background checks and the sensitivities and all of that. Again, if we can normalize how we relate to one another, um, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I think you're, you're asking a really good question about how do we as church come alongside folks um, formally and informally? Um, as I said, I don't have an answer. <laughs> Um, but I think as much as we can normalize our interactions and be there for one another over time is really impactful. Gary, and then I think John Sweeney had a question too. Gary, do you wanna go? Sure. Um, I don't quite know how to put this. It's more, more of a statement than a question perhaps, but um, I'm not gonna get into my background uh, today, but. Um, I felt uh, without having any formal education in this in my hometown, either in the school or in the church, my congregation, I have been really lucky, fortunate, blessed, however you want to put that, whatever word you want to use in terms of, I probably linked to your theology, however, what, what you believe. Um, but I had a congregation and a school in which I felt uh, I had, they were refuges for me, mm-hmm. refuge places, refuge people. And I don't know if there's a question here somewhere, but uh, there was no, this has really been a wonderful presentation, by the way, Anne. I just really appreciate it a lot. It's Good. brought back all kinds of uh, memories um, and, uh, I had people who were just there. Mm-hmm. They were present, the power of presence. And I, I, I remember, I mean, they didn't know any of this stuff, but they right. knew, I, I remember an organist in a con- the congregation I grew up in, she one time on a Sunday morning, because I used to go to church alone without my family. And, uh, and the organist said to me one Sunday after church, she said, I'm really glad you're here. It's important for the congregation to see you here. And it's important for me to see you here. Boy, that meant the world to me mm-hmm. at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm getting tears in my eyes, I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, that kind of thing is not, it's educate. I don't know how you educate people to do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but it's, uh, it's very important. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Gary. This is not rocket science. This is how we relate to one another. Um, But it is now science. (laughs) Now we have the science that demonstrates the value of the relationships that you were talking about. And for, for, for the future, now we have lived experience and science together to say, this is what we need in our communities. 
This is how we make sure that we all feel loved and belonging, you know, that sense of belonging. And many of us, I, I think the other message I would say is when you're talking about those adverse childhood experiences, we're talking about all of us. We're talking about all of us. Now, some of us have a zero and some of us have a 10, but there's a lot of room in between there. Um, and it, it, it's about healing for all of us. It isn't just about those bad kids over there who get sent to the principal's office. This is about how we build this up for all of us who've experienced whatever positive and adverse experiences. What if we did another forum or similar to tell each other what exactly helped us personally to survive from our backgrounds? I think that's a really good thought, Susan, I, I, with one caution. Um, when you he, I know enough about brain development and you know the triggers in your brain to know that when there are times when you hear someone else's story that it just triggers mm. the reaction in your own brain. So I would say if you can focus on those things that helped you mm -hmm. as opposed to having to tell the whole story, yeah, you can move forward. Yeah, yep. that's great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. John Sweeney, you had a, your hand up and then um, Jean. Uh, on, on her second, uh, on, the, on the pyramid, the second layer dealt with, I think, cognitive effects. And mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. My wife has uh, Alzheimer's, but she, and I didn't know her as a child, but she had a very traumatic childhood. She mm. lost her mother when she was 12. She lost her father in an alcohol-related uh, accident when she was 17. Mm. And... Uh, anything I, there was never any abuse but I think neglect she didn't have a father in her life even though he was under the same roof and she had uh, two positive an aunt and uncle that treated her like her own daughter and then she had a, a, a spinster aunt that were very close to her so those were the two uh, outside uh, uh, influences on her but I've often wondered if there was any correlation to that trauma with what's happened to her. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you think about all of the 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 neuroscience and the brain science that's out there, I, I think it's very clear the answer would likely be yes, that those those traumatic events for her, the loss of both of her parents and everything that might have happened in between there had an influence on her brain development, on her emotional and coping ability. And um, I don't know that I've ever seen anything that correlates that to dementia um, yet. And I say yet, because I suspect there's work out there um, that could be very well true. I've always joked that uh, uh, because of all the losses she had in her life, I thought I, I was probably a benefactor of it. And, I, I tell my friends that when she met me, she said, well, he ain't much, but he's all mine. I mean, hey, <laughs> hang on to him. <laughs> oh, and the thanks, blessing John. is yeah. that she still has you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Jean, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just thinking of the most recent thing that struck me that you said uh, was, and was uh, how to find a, a normalcy in relationship in congregations. And uh, I think about um, I think about uh, people turning away from church because they think people are trying to fix me mm -hmm. or give me the answers. Mm -hmm. The second thing was was further back what you said right at the beginning of the presentation, how we start with the thought of what is wrong with me, mm -hmm. and I I wonder the connection to that and shame, how we can't love why we often can't love ourselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. boy when i think about um that whole shift from what's wrong to what happened um i think about that in relationship not just to kids but to adults and i teach a class for clergy around trauma 
and we all we often refer to the story of the church kitchen lady <laughs> who is in control of the kitchen who knows who's coming and going and where everything belongs and likes to be in control think about that from the from the concept of what happened or what might be happening maybe there's not control anywhere else in her life maybe she had a very controlling parent and it just shifts your thinking into what the heck is wrong with this lady she has to be in control of everything to huh i wonder what happened there that causes this to okay i want to know what paul and marilyn are what paul t they're laughing hysterically here <laughs> i think i hit a nerve maybe no but but i i just say it just shifts your thinking into being a little bit more compassionate and a little bit more kind because you never know what happens to someone mm -hmm. and how does that change our thinking as we relate to one another yeah absolutely yeah and i appreciate that you bring up that compassion part mm -hmm. um you know there's that saying uh, and I, be kind to everyone you don't know what burdens they're carrying or along that line um and so i think that that's important as we you know look at our current behaviors how they're informed by our past experiences too so mm -hmm. I, and, and i love that that you know you're talking about the science it's almost like there's science now to back up how we're called to live as the body of christ yes um, yeah so that's a pretty beautiful thing um we're just about at our time so i want to make sure that if anybody had a question they have their opportunity to ask no question but a thank you big thank you very much so yeah and this has been super helpful um and a couple people here in this group um are have been involved in um thinking about our partic our participation in mental health connect mm, and yes. we'll we'll be um having much more information about that in the coming um weeks and months but if you're looking for resources, please uh, reach out. There's um, Susan's here, Michael's here, I'm here, Esther, anybody else in that? G Gary, yep. Um, there goes my clock, sorry. Um, so <laughs> um, please let us know. Michael, you have a, a final look, word. Look for our mental health table at in-person worship in upcoming services. I sit on their board, so I have a bias towards them too. So. <laughs> That's the Mental Health Connect project. They're yep. cooperating with us. We'll have literature. We'll have people talking mm -hmm. about this. And it's just a way to let our people know that we care. Nice. Nice. And I, I for one second, I, if you want to delve into this whole concept of positive childhood experiences more, there's one website where Dr. Sege has a whole boatload of information. And it's just positiveexperience.org. Wonderful. Thank you. Lots for that. of resources there. Oh, and if need be, contact me. I'm happy to be a resource however I can. And your contact information is? Um, my email address is A E L L I S O number one at fairview.org. Or I'll give you my cell phone because 952-956-2481. Can you say your email again? Yep. A-E-L-L-I-S-O, the number one, at fairview.org. Um, can I say something a minute? Yeah, go ahead, Kirsten. Um, I missed the beginning, but one thing I really appreciated um, during COVID, I don't know what we would have done before technology, but um, it's really, I don't know if you mentioned like FaceTime is like really helpful to connect with my grandchildren that don't live close or, you know, I, we were, they were not in my bubble or whatever, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be able to 
like we have a new grandbaby that lives in Las Vegas and I haven't seen him yet, but he'll talk to me on FaceTime. He's seven mm-hmm. months. And <laughs> it's, it's nice that we have FaceTime, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so that and helps me, that helps me too, men, you know, mm-hmm. mentally mm-hmm. and connection wise, because I'm not working full time right now, but I've started doing music with the elders that um, John knows he's seen me, <laughs> but oh. I just started doing that again, going around to different assisted livings and um, cool. I was an activity coordinator for 20 years, but um yeah, because I'm used to people all the time, and it's so it's a little been a little tough. So, mm-hmm. but anyway, I was just saying, fate with all this, it's a good thing we have FaceTime and all that. You know, not everybody has that, but luckily, yeah. you know, the kids of the elders, you know, have brought the, you know, the and the activity directors have had them use uh, the iPads and mm-hmm. yeah. And, and just a reminder too that the forums are recorded so you can go to YouTube and share those it, go back and watch the information again or to share that with others too so that opportunity is there and thank you so much for all You're of your work welcome. and your presentation has been wonderful You're very welcome thank you all right thank, thank you all you. see you have soon. a good day thank you thank you, you too. Thank you.